attained the stage of attraction for Krishna and who is not freed from the material impasse but who has qualified himself to enter into the kingdom of God is called sadhaka. So how is it possible that one is not freed from the material impasse as is described yet has qualified himself to enter into the kingdom of God? Hmm? How is it possible? Well, in the stage of devotional service according to regulative principles, uh, Krishna sees the devotee trying to perform devotional service. Uh, the devotee develops the intention or the desire to perform pure devotional service and satisfy the Lord by ecstatic love. At that time, Krishna says, okay, I will, I will liberate this devotee. And from that point on, as long as the devotee does not deviate from the process of devotional service, Krishna arranges his gradual liberation. Even if it takes, you know, more than one lifetime, Krishna will gradually arrange everything so that that devotee becomes successful. See, from the time that the devotee develops the desire for complete liberation from material existence. He is considered to, uh, to uh, att have attained the qualification of entering the spiritual world, even though he's not there yet. And Srila Prabhupada used to use the example of someone who is traveling to a foreign country, say by airplane, uh, that before going, he buys the ticket. And he's already paid his ticket. Uh, but he hasn't left yet. So you might say, well, how can you say that he's qualified to go to this other country because he's still here? Huh? But in, in, his, in his wallet, he has the ticket, see? So all he has to do when the time comes is present his ticket and then he goes. So similarly, this, the sadhu, the sadhaka, has earned the qualification to go to the spiritual world. He's paid his ticket by developing this desire. And Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that manmana bhava mad bhakto, simply uh, keep me in your heart and always think of me, worship me, become my devotee, bow down before me, offer your service to me, offer your homage to me. Uh, but if you can't do that, Follow the principles of regulated devotional service because that will develop the desire to attain me. See? And that is the actual price of attaining liberation. As soon as we develop that desire, oh, I want to be liberated. I want to be a pure devotee. I want to develop love for Krishna. When that desire becomes rooted in the heart and permanently established in the heart, that is the ticket. That is the price of going to the spiritual world. So that, that can be established simply by seeing the RT ceremony. Every aspect of this devotional service is so powerful. Okay? Question from Tiago. Please accept my humble obeisances. We know that surrender is very powerful against offenses, against the holy name and anartas. Yet people tend to overlook it because it is the most, it is the most troublesome to them. <laughs> the third, the three part question is, first, what does it mean to surrender mind and senses to Krishna? Should I continue reading? No, let's, let me address that question first. Yeah, you're, you're right. Um, surrender is required to attain the perfection of devotional service. Krishna himself says at the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita, Sarvadharman prityaja maam ekam sharanam vraja give up all different kinds of religion, uh, sarva dharma, purityaja, and uh, just surrender to me alone, mam ekam, 
Sharanang Braja. Braja means go, do it. Uh, Sharanang means take shelter, surrender. Sharanang, also Sharanagati. Uh, Sharanam Agati, go, do it. Sharanagati. So the act of surrender is called Sharanagati. And um, this is absolutely necessary to attain pure devotional service. But uh, you may have noticed that we don't stress it very much in our preaching. And this is precisely because of the attitude of especially Westerners who feel that um, this mood of surrender is very threatening to their false ego. <laughs> So uh, we don't stress it. In, instead, we, we stress the experiential approach of uh, take this knowledge and perform the experiment, implement it in your life, and then you'll see that you get the result. Uh, and in this way, you'll develop trust. And from on this platform of trust, then we can start talking about surrender. But without surrender, actually, you cannot uh, approach Krishna. Why should Krishna accept anyone as his devotee unless they surrender to him? Uh, Krishna is the supreme. You know, so does he want somebody saying, oh, yes, Krishna, I'm your devotee, but I'm leaving the back door open just in case things don't work out. You know, I can go back to being in a material life. I mean, what, what, what would you say if you were going to marry some girl, for example, and she says, well, yeah, I'd like to marry you, but uh, just in case, you know, I'm still seeing my old boyfriend. <laughs> huh? What would you think? Huh? So how do you think Krishna feels when we approach him and we say, yeah, I want to be your devotee, but I still want to maintain my material attachments? This is called mixed devotional service, Mishra Bhakti, or motivated devotional service, because we're, we want to get something for ourselves out of our service. So in either case, uh, we can't advance very far without surrender. Now, what was the first part of the question? Three parts, right? What was the first the one? First, the first question is, what does it mean to surrender mind and senses to Krishna? Well, what does it mean? What does it mean? What do you mean, what do I mean? <laughs> surrender means surrender. There's no uh, ifs, ands, or buts. Huh? There's no, no waffling, no compromise, no uh, exceptions. Uh, it means surrender. You do whatever Krishna wants, period. And Krishna makes his desires perfectly clear in the scriptures. So there's no need to guess about what it means. It's all described very elaborately in the first few chapters of Nectar of Devotion. All the rules and regulations are there. Either you do them or you don't do them. Uh, if, you, if you want to surrender, it means you, you give up all the things that you're supposed to give up and you do all the things you're supposed to do. You follow the instructions of Krishna, you follow the instructions of the spiritual master. That's surrender. Anything else is not surrender, <laughs> period. Very simple. What's the second part? Can I, can I add something? What's that? That uh, in, the, in the process of surrender at the... Wait, wait, hey, don't throw apart. those headphones. In the process of surrender at the very beginning, there is uh, many parts that are unconscious to, to the devotees. Like we were studying in the community website, a list of defense mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And all these uh, defense mechanisms have the, the quality that they're unconscious. So even if someone like is thinking, oh, I'd like to surrender, they, they, they can't consciously do it because of so many cheating experiences in the past. So this is very recommended uh, to understand how have we been cheated and then remove all that past trauma so that one is able to surrender to Guru or to begin 
the process of surrender. Mm -hmm. And the other part is that usually the guru will give many instructions and uh, the beginning one is very neophyte and rebellious and like that and uh, won't follow. And then after three or five or ten times that every time the instruction, you follow the instruction and it works, then this rebelliousness reduces and it becomes like, oh well, I'll just follow. So That's it, why we preach in the beginning. We don't preach surrender in the beginning, we preach try it. <laughs> and see what happens. Huh? Okay, so continue the, with the second question. Yeah. Please explain the importance of surrendering to the spiritual master for someone who wants to surrender to Krishna. Well, how are you going to surrender to Krishna if you can't surrender to his 